Three weeks in October 2002, a time seared into our memories. But stepping over the line, shooting a kid, I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Absolute horror. This isn't supposed to happen in a community like this. As two murderous snipers encircled the Washington, D.C. area, a time when we all realized that our life or death in those 22 days was just a matter of chance. Thank you for joining us once again. I'm Melanie Alnwick, and this is Three Weeks of Hell, the DC Snipers podcast. And I'm Bob Barnard. Today, we're gonna hear from two women who didn't know each other, but whose lives were forever connected by the sniper case. One is the ex-wife of one of the snipers, and the other is the widow of the police chief trying to catch them. In the fall of 2002, Mildred Muhammad was in many ways like all of us in the D.C. area, watching the news, scanning the parking lots, wondering where the snipers might try to strike next. But Mildred was also looking over her shoulder for another reason. Her ex-husband, John, who she says had threatened to kill her after she won full custody of their three children. Mildred had just settled into a townhouse community in Clinton, Maryland, enrolled her kids in school and started a job. She vividly remembers a moment when her internal safety alarms started going off. At this point, most people were still looking for a white box truck. So October 11th, a coworker convinced me to allow her to pick me up to bring me to work. I'm still at Southern Maryland Hospital. And so when I get in the car, she said, you know, there's a dark colored car outside your cul-de-sac. I'm getting a real bad feeling about that car. I said, yeah, girl, it's okay, let's just go to work. So we pass by the car. The driver looks at us, but the passenger has a newspaper, and as we're passing by the car, he raises the paper up so we can't see him. And I said, did you see that? She said, yeah. I said, give me your phone. So I called 911. I said, there's a dark colored Caprice or Impala with New Jersey plates, two African-American males seated outside the car, seated in the car. And she said, okay, we'll, we'll get somebody over there to investigate. So didn't hear anything back. 12 days later, her deepest fears would collide. On October 23rd, ATF and the FBI knocked on my door and said, um, when was the last time you heard from John Allen Muhammad? So my, my palms started sweating. And I said, why are you asking me about John? I said, well, we just want to know when was the last time you heard from him? I said, September 2001 at an emergency custody hearing. I, would, I had gained custody of our children, and that's the last thing I heard from him. I said, well, have you heard of any shootings in other parts of the country? I said, no. OK. But well, we need for you to come down to the police station. I say, why? Well, we just want to ask you some questions. So they take me into the interrogation room, table. I'm seated on this side. It's a detective over there, two detectives on this side. And they said, so when was the last time you seen John Allen Muhammad? I say September 2001 as, at an emergency custody hearing. And you haven't talked to him since? I say, no. No, I haven't. So the, that agent was just walking back and forth on his phone in and out of the room. So the agent said, so we need for you to read this letter. Look at this letter. Tell us if you recognize the handwriting. And it was the letter that was posted to the tree. So do you recognize this handwriting? I said, no, sir, I don't. So we need for you to listen to this CD. It was a, a voice. Tell us if you recognize the voice. I'm listening. I'm listening. 
the voice had an accent. And I said, no, I don't, I don't recognize the voice. So the agent walked in, put his phone down and said, look, Ms. Muhammad, we're just going to have to tell you. We're going to name your ex-husband as the sniper. I said, what? John? They said, yes, my head hit the table. They said, well, do you think he would do something like this? I raised my head. I looked in the corner. I said, yeah. They said, well, why would you think that? I said, well, we were watching a movie. I don't remember the name of it, but he said, I could take a small city, terrorize it. They would think it would be a group of people and it would only be me. I asked him why would he do something like that and he changed the subject. They said, well, Ms. Muhammad, would you like to go into protective custody? I said, you got to ask me that? They said, well, yeah, because some people don't want to go. I said, okay, have you caught him yet? No, ma'am. Do you know where he is? No, ma'am. And you still have to ask me, did I want to go? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I want to go into protective custody. However, we have to go and get my children, my sister, and my brother-in-law. So we leave the police station. We go to Clinton to get my family. The first person I see when I walk in is my son. And I pull him in the bathroom. I say, honey, they're going to name your dad as the sniper. He starts to melt down to the floor. And I say, mm -mm, you can't break down right now. We got to go. So I pull him downstairs with my daughters, tell them the same thing, and they start crying. I say, you can't, we, we, you can't, can't cry. We got to get some clothes, we got to pack, and we got to go, we got to go. They took us to a hotel, and when we got in the room is when I turned on the TV, and that was the first time that they had shown this picture. I walked up to the TV screen, put my hand on it, and said, what happened to you? My son crying on one bed, my daughters are crying on the other. I pulled them together until they cried themselves to sleep. I got a pillow, I went in the bathroom, turned on the water in the tub, turned on the water in the sink, closed the door, sat on the floor, and screamed in the pillow. Because I didn't know what to do and I didn't know who to call. And to be clear, at the time, you had not made any connection between the two threats to your personal safety, John and the sniper. It was a sniper. They told the two Caucasian in a white box truck, clearly John does not fit that description. So I was looking for two Caucasians and I was looking for John. Had your children mentioned to you that they had this new brother when they were in Antigua? No, they didn't mention Lee. They only mentioned Lee when they saw him on TV. What was that like for you? Well, Lee was their friend. And that's when they told me that dad brought him in as the big brother to take care of them while he their dad took care of other business. So Lee was their best friend. He took care of them when John was gone. So once they started to see him on TV and I was calling him Malvo, they say, Mom, his name is not Malvo, his name is Lee. So, okay, I will start saying Lee. When they found out that he was going to be charged and his trial was coming up. Then they all came to me because they, they did then and they still do come to me in a group, you know, like the power couple or whatever. <laughs> and they say, Mom, you got to help Lee. I said, so why do I have to help Lee? I said, well, Lee is our friend, Mom. And if it wasn't for dad, Lee wouldn't be in this situation. So we need you to help him, mom. So I started to do my own research and listen to interviews. And it was this one article in the paper that I read. And although he was being interviewed, the words were John. They weren't his words. The way and the tone in which he spoke 
who was mimicking John. So I called his attorney and I said, so my children say that I need to help Lee and how, how can I do that? What can I do? They said, well, thank you for calling. We'd like for you to come down to Virginia Beach to testify. I said, okay. So I told my children I was testifying and they were happy about that. He said, because Lee should not be in jail. This is all dad. You know how dad is when he manipulates people. I said, okay. Lee's attorney got up and said, Miss Muhammad, you are the reason they came here. You were their target. Do you remember this young man? I said, no, sir, I don't. I said, well, they found you. See, John sent Lee to your door pretending to be a salesperson. And his instructions were, when you open the door to shoot you in the face. Well, Miss Muhammad, you opened that door. And for whatever reason, he walked away. So we don't know the reason why he didn't kill you that day, nor do we know the repercussions that he suffered from John because he did not. So you were the target, Miss Muhammad. That's why they came here. How do you, if you, if you care to answer, how do you feel about Lee Boyd Malvo today? The only thing I know about Lee is at the time my children needed help, he was there. At the time my children needed food to be taken care of because John, because John was not there, he was. So I don't have any, I'm grateful to him for that, but I don't have any other emotions towards him. You had said that uh, while you and your children were in that hotel room, you said, I watched the light in their eyes grow dimmer. They knew the worst things were possible. How were you able to pull them out of this and help them to grow up knowing what they knew about their father and about their brother? I say brother in quotes. Right. So. I tried to get counseling. Unfortunately, it was a high profile case. And there were a lot of people that wanted to report what I said or the DC Sniper's children had to say. And so I decided that I would go to the library, get a book on counseling, and learn how to counsel them myself. And the ground rules were, you can say whatever you feel you need to say, but number one, be respectful. Number two, do not try to impose your emotions on your siblings because they are entitled to their emotions as well. And any questions you have about your dad, I will tell you the truth. I'm your best resource for the good, the bad, and the ugly about him. And even if it makes me look bad, I will tell you the truth. The only way we're gonna make it out of this is with the truth. So you cannot at any point in time use your dad as an excuse for failure. You gotta bring me something worse than my dad is the DC sniper and I can't do A, B, C, and D. It's not gonna work. So they wanted to watch home movies and they wanted me to narrate. So I had to take my stuff, my emotions, fears, all of that, and push them aside to give them what they needed. And so we went through all of the videos. And they laughed, we even popped popcorn and watched, and they remembered a few things. But my sole purpose for doing that was to help them to process who their dad was to who their dad is and what he's done. And I told them that 
under no circumstances will we allow anyone to hold us accountable or responsible for the crimes of their dad. He made a conscious decision to do what he did and whatever the jury, the jury's verdict is, we will accept it and we will move on. And that's what we did. Did people ever try to identify them as, oh, you're the sniper's kids? No, they didn't know. I didn't put them in the news. I didn't say their names. And I told them that you don't have to tell people that he's your dad. If you are friends with someone, let's say you meet the person and six months later you see this person is gonna be good, a good friend to you, then tell them. And then to let them know, hey, if you don't wanna be my friend anymore, I'm good, but I just don't go around telling everybody, hey, my dad was a DZ sniper. I mean, just, that's just crazy, I don't, I don't do that. And so, that helped them to build the confidence within themselves and also allowed them to see how people would react. Because we, I made them watch the news. You need to know what people are saying about your dad. And you need to know how you're going to respond if somebody recognizes you or sees you and they ask you, is that your dad? What are you going to say? You know, we went through all of that. So. And you went through this long period of time, again, of, of keeping this private, of keeping silent. When did you decide that you weren't going to be silent anymore? So the advocate's name was Norma Harley. <laughs> Just gonna say her name, <laughs> Norma Harley. She contacted me to speak at a conference at the Prince George's County Community College. And it was to show domestic abuse and violence in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So we each told our story. And it was at that point that I said, okay, I can. But before I even went there, I talked to my children. I said, look, I got to help other people with this. And the only way I can do that is to share our story about your dad. How do y'all feel about that? And they say, Mom, as long as you tell the truth, we're okay. We're okay with it. And so um, that's when I started sharing my story. And then at some point you decided to begin writing. An, a few nonprofit organizations asked me to put my story in writing because it would reach more people than it would be for me to go speak in, in other places. So how many books now? Twelve. Twelve books. My first book is Scared Silent, When the One You Love Becomes the One You Fear. That's one memoir. The second one is I'm Still Standing, Crawling Out of the Darkness into the Light. You can see all of her titles on her website, MildredMuhammad.com. Mildred describes how she and her children overcame the difficulties they faced in the wake of the negative media attention and threats from people in her community. Mildred has a new book out released just last month called In the Midst of Chaos, Home is Not the Safest Place to Be. Mildred says it's a collection of stories from abuse survivors and how they triumphed. And where does your strength come from? My strength comes from my faith. What gets me up every day is knowing there's somebody out there that needs my help. I mean, my purpose, I didn't find my purpose, my purpose found me. But, you, but you've been able to get some of you back through the work that you're doing. Right, I got all of me back. I just, um, so when you, when you are a victim of domestic violence, and you have children, the value that you have in yourself, you transfer it to your children so that what the abuser is doing to you, it doesn't bother you, right? But you've heard him say, but as soon as he touched my children, that's because the value of the children are higher. So I was speaking to a client the other day, and so the, the way that you get your value back 
is you go get your nails done, you go get your hair done, you go to the store and start shopping for yourself. Even if you just buy a pair of socks, just get something for yourself. And in that, it, you're increasing your value yourself. You don't need an outside person to tell you your worth. You can determine that as you continue to take care of yourself. And so that is, so I'm, I'm good. How are your children today? They're adults now, right? Mm -hmm. They're adults. My uh, son is engaged to be married. He's 32. My son's name is John Jr. He's a manager at Sunglass Hut. My uh, daughter, Selena, she starts her, she's married and she starts her new job at NASA. And my daughter, Taliba, she works in DC. Um, and they're all doing well. They all went to college. Um, they all um, have their friends. Their friends know who their dad is or was. They know what I do, so there's, there are no surprises, so to speak. And so that's where we are. We're doing great. Which I think is such a testament to you as a mom because it could have so easily turned out to be a different story. Yeah, but I wasn't gonna let it do that. So I, 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 I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to allow my children to be, to feel that they could not move forward because their dad is the DC sniper. That's not how our story is going to end. And I told them that this is not, this is, this is a part of our story, but this is not the end of our story. Mildred told us that Taliba and Selena sing classical music in eight different languages. Taliba is working to become an artist under the stage name Tolivia. That's Olivia with a T. You can find her on TikTok and Instagram. Here's a clip from the latest single she's working on. Wow, Melanie, another compelling interview with uh, Mildred Muhammad. She was in episode four, but here in our most recent episode, again, you know, the life that she had to, to navigate there, raising kids at the time, she didn't even know her ex-husband was killing people all around the D.C. area. And I, and I said it to her in, in the podcast, it's just what she went through as a mom and having to bring her children through this is incredible. And the fact that she has remained a strong survivor and an advocate for other domestic abuse survivors, that has really become her mission in life. Yeah, she's taken on a great voice. Thanks, Mel. Well, we also want to hear uh, from another woman who was forever touched by the events of October 2002. She is Sandy Moose, the widow of the then Montgomery County Police Chief, Charles Moose. You should understand that I hope to God that someday we'll know why all of this occurred. Thank you. He's been a large presence in this podcast as the public face of the investigation into the sniper killings. Chief Moose died from an aneurysm on Thanksgiving Day 2021, almost a year ago. He was 68 years old and living in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. I asked Sandy Moose about losing her husband of 34 years. The day he passed, he had already made his drinks for his 20-mile bike ride the next day. So that's a guy that's planning on living, right? He was watching football, and I just heard him say my name. Uh, instead of Sandy, he said Nandy. And I had this immediate dread and went into the room he was in, and, and he was in the middle of leaving. Oh, I'm so, so sorry to hear that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, I was just, you know, neither one of us were prepared. Sandy and Charles Moose had most recently been living in Florida. He'd been retired. They have two adult sons, an adopted daughter, and six grandchildren. Charles Moose was the police chief in Portland, Oregon, when he was hired by Montgomery County in 1999. That was three years before the sniper killings. I asked Sandy Moose what it was like for Chief Moose back then, when he was trying to stop a killer, turned out it was two killers, who were terrorizing the D.C. region. It wasn't like it was uh, daunting or 
or like he was not up to the task. He he did have a um, bit of a you know why me why you know why me why now Montgomery County like they hit their whole year's death toll in one uh, one week there pretty much I think there was twelve homicides the year before you know <laughs> and so he's like whoa this is crazy but but as far as um you know he's always been a guy that just dealt whatever was given him and and he always looked for purpose in it and uh, as i'm going through his things you know and um he made a lot of little notes about his feelings uh from day to day or month to month or sometimes it was years and he would revisit one of the journals and uh, see what he had lived up to and failed at and uh, so I'm finding a, a lot of notes about how he felt you know during um, during the sniper shooting and then also kind of a, as a retrospect like I found one I was reading last night and it was uh, about his own life and the pinnacle of success and and then what you know and then were was i too successful uh, that no one would let me have a success again or meet with success again chief moose left his job with montgomery county after writing a book about his experience during the sniper case it was titled three weeks in october the manhunt for the serial sniper Moose was criticized for writing the book and going on tour promoting it just a year after the shootings, while the cases against the snipers were still working their way through the court system. That controversy is what led to his resignation from the Montgomery County Police Department. Sandy tells a poignant story about her husband's reaction to the shooting of Iron Brown. Iron was the 13-year-old sniper victim shot and wounded outside his middle school on October 7, 2002 in the middle of the killing spree. The tear that he uh, shed when he was talking about Iran Brown. Yes. Getting shot. You know, he called me right after that press conference and he goes, I might have blown it. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't stop my emotions and it's just, I'm just, it'll just land where it will. And I'm like, you know, people that see you know your, um, commitment and your passion and you'll be okay so but anyway uh, when he died he was in his recliner and a tear rolled down the same cheek just one just one tear wow. he made me so sad was it one of the few times you'd ever see him yes. seen him shed a tear well the, not that kind of tear. I mean, you know, I, I don't. I've seen Charles be upset, and I've seen him cry, but this was just so different. It was just one tear, and it just rolled down his cheek. And of course, there was so much written and said about that tear that rolled down his cheek. I just, you know. Wow! Thank you for just, sharing that. Wow. It was just. <laughs> You know, how do you think he like when he would, you know, just kind of reflect on his time handling this sniper case? How did he how did he sum up how he performed? You know, um, you know, I, he was defensive when people would say, you know, you you chase the wrong person or and people have called him ineffective or whatever. But all in all, they closed the deal. They got the people. You know, he wished he could have done it quicker, you know, but three weeks to catch a serial murderer with a, you know, with a accomplice like the guy had is pretty quick, but it, it felt like it lasted forever. After leaving Montgomery County, Sandy and Charles moved to Hawaii. She says he actually entered the police academy to restart his career in law enforcement. He was trying to solve a personal problem we had. Um, when we left Montgomery County, we we had our pension in Portland, and uh, they we signed up for health care and all of that. Of course, we have to pay for it, but it's the opportunity to buy it. And then so we had moved on to Hawaii and then learned that um, – that somebody had made a mistake and we could not buy their their insurance he had left one month too soon 
um, in the retirement. You know, it needed to be 25, and it was 24 and 11 months. So that's when he started setting to solving our problem of health care. You know, I had uh, pre-existing conditions, and nobody would just let us buy it. And so that's he... Uh, went through the academy just like all the other young kids he was 53 and became a police officer so i mean he, he wrote a lot about that about um what he was doing and how he was competing in a young man's uh, a young person's game and uh you know <laughs> trying to trying to stay healthy enough to to make the grade and he did he he graduated the academy and the young people just like they didn't even know he was police chief anywhere or that he was chief moose until one guy in particular, he, they were watching a training video and Charles was the trainer <laughs> and he's like, that's you. Wow. <laughs> and it, it, so that's how modest Charles was about his, he was very modest about who he was, what he had been through, what he had accomplished. It's been nearly a year since Charles died. As he wrote in those notes he left behind, Sandy says Charles knew that success and failure are close cousins. I just read that in in last night's what he was writing, when, and it was no regrets. That's all he, he put, no regrets. And so he didn't live his life um, regretting things. It's, you know, he, he like looked at the next opportunity. How am I going to... You know, and and opportunity means more than like, you know, am I going to land another job? It's opportunities to have fun, to be well, to, you know, he he was a bodybuilder at one point, you know, and he, he really treated his body like a science experiment in some ways. If he wanted this to be bigger or that to develop, you know, you got to do X, Y, and Z. So he, he was much more analytical internally than people probably ever realized. Sandy shared with us a photo of Charles in a natural bodybuilding competition when he was 30. If you are watching this uh, podcast, man, was he ripped. They tried to make the most of their time off, though Sandy says about four years ago, Charles applied to get his old job back as chief in Portland, Oregon. He wasn't selected, and she says that stung, but all in all, Sandy says her husband was proud of his career and life of public service. Charles became a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force after Montgomery County, and I just want our grandkids to see he didn't stop living, he didn't stop accomplishing things. He had been uh, in the Air National Guard in Oregon, and then he joined the D.C. Guard when we got to D.C., and uh, then um, he joined the Hawaii Guard when we, once we got settled in, in Hawaii. And so he went to uh, Hawaii as a major, <clears throat> and then he got promoted to lieutenant colonel. After he knew he was probably not coming back ever into law enforcement, he sat with his uh, uh, mound of stuff ready to be deployed to the Middle East for about uh, five months. He's like, yeah, I want to go. I'm signing up. Here I am. And, you know, the, his, his people would have to walk around his big old green sack to get you know, into the chair next to him. He's like, I just wanted to know I'm ready to go. <laughs> and that was Charles. And you heard Sandy Moose say that she's had some health issues and some recent setbacks, she told us. And that's why she wanted to do her interview over the phone, not be, you know, recorded uh, with a camera. Uh, but we are grateful that she shared part of her story with us. And, and you know what I was really touched by was it really gave me a sense of Charles Moose as a person, as a dad, and a father and you know you see him in front of the cameras and he's larger than life he's just a guy doing a job and also after that just trying to make things happen for his family yeah. and you can tell that sandy and charles had a wonderful relationship and a great bond and uh I, my heart goes out to her and and i do hope that she is doing okay and she is she we you know beyond what you've heard there we chatted and she yeah she's she is doing okay besides these little health setbacks so what's coming up uh, melanie in episode nine our final episode of this podcast i can't believe it's here but we have finally arrived at the point of capture so we're going to talk about that night and the things that happened then and and as we've learned even that didn't go smoothly we're going to talk about an attempted escape by lee malvo by lee malvo and some other really interesting things you learn from Malvo's lawyers. 
yes, we spoke to both of them who were like the rest of us, just kind of like ducking and weaving for three weeks uh, in October of 2002. And then right after the capture, they said, oh, by the way, you two lawyers in Fairfax, you're going to represent uh, the younger sniper. And so they talk about Lee Boyd Malvo and, and all that that entailed and the trials and what have you. And some of these victims who you've heard from throughout this podcast coming face to face in the courtroom, in the courtroom with the sniper. So we'll have all of that coming up in our final episode nine of Three Weeks of Hell, the DC Sniper. So you can find it on all your podcast platforms. Yeah, and, and also on our fox5dc.com website and our YouTube channel. Thank you, as always, for tuning in.